Yes, so I'm delighted to be speaking with Roxana Robinson and Louis Beyer this morning. First, I want to thank our host, the Library of Congress, for putting together this wonderful event. Um, and I want to mention that we're going to speak for, I think, 30 minutes and then have a question and answer session. So please have questions and hold on to them um, till the end of the program, and we'll give you a chance to ask them. Thanks so much. So today, Ro Roxana Robinson, on my right, is the author of six novels, three collections of short stories, and a biography of Georgia O'Keeffe. She's the former president of the Authors Guild and teaches at the MFA program at Hunter College. Her latest novel is Dawson's Fall. And on my right here is Louis Byard, the, uh, an author of nine novels. He's a specialist in historical fiction and his subjects have included Theodore Roosevelt, Edgar Allan Poe, and the 16th century English astronomer Thomas Harriet. He's also an essayist and short story writer and teaches at George Washington University, and his latest novel is Courting Mr. Lincoln. So let's talk about the genesis of these books, which are both set in the 19th century, and although Louis Byard's novel is about Abraham Lincoln, it's actually not set at, at, in the Civil War no. That, that before, yeah. um, Roxana's book, uh, Dawson's Fall, is set mostly after the Civil War, but features a Civil War section. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Roxana. You've written several lovely novels. Oh. I was wondering about that. everyone. Um, it's better. Is that better? Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's start. I could hear her fine. I don't know what you're <laughs> Okay. I'm going to start with a question for Roxana, who you've written several lovely novels that deal in various ways with families, history, and trauma. Um, and in that sense, Dawson's Fall is in keeping with the themes that have preoccup preoccupied you as a, as a writer. Um, but this is the first novel you've written that's actually based in history. And indeed, the characters at the center of this novel are ancestors of yours. What is the, tell us about the genesis of this book. Um, so just to start out with, and forgive me for sounding like an adolescent boy, I just got a cold, so my voice is gonna go up and down. I apologize. Um, so, the books I've written before are really about moral questions, always. They, they're set in the family, but um, I'm really interested in moral issues of, of uh, guilt and honor and shame. So that's the sort of the... Been the through line. Yeah, the through line. All my books um, cost was about heroin addiction and what the family's responsibility is in that. Sparta's about our responsibility to our veterans and, and what war means to us as a country. And Dawson's Fall is about my great-grandparents. And my great-grandfather was an Englishman who came to this country to fight for the Confederacy. And he married my great-grandmother, who was from Baton Rouge. And he spent the rest of his life in Charleston, South Carolina, where he became the editor of the Charleston News and Courier. And he was a liberal voice for the New South. And in my family, every family has its own culture, and we all tell our, tell our children and our grandchildren stories that reinforce our own version of who we are as a family. And in my family, he was talked about as a kind of a hero because he stood up for black freedmen, he believed in the rule of law, he tried to ban lynching. So, so we, we were proud of him. Um, but the more I thought about him, as somebody who came to fight for the Confederacy, which is supporting um, a crime against humanity, I, I was trying to understand how it was possible for someone who was principled and believed in the rule of law and believed in human rights, how that was possible to integrate those things. And Dawson wasn't the only person like that. There were many hundreds of thousands of people in the South who believed they were good people and yet were complicit in a system that was a crime against humanity. So I wanted to, the reason I write novels is to understand a problem that I don't understand. So I set out to write this novel trying to understand 
who my great-grandparents had been, how they could be people of principle and yet complicit in this gigantic national crime. So I thought that I was writing about my family, but it turned out I was writing about my country. How much of Frank Dawson's story did you know when you undertook the project? I knew, um, I, won't, um, I, I won't spoil the book, but um, his life was very dramatic. And so I knew about the dramatic part. We all knew that. Um, and then I wrote, <clears throat> I wrote a piece about, the, about him for the Times about uh, seven or eight years ago. He just started entering into my mind. And it, I never thought that I would write about this subject because this is my father's family. On my mother's family, my great 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 aunt is Harriet Beecher Stowe. So, um, listen, we should we should pause here to say that Roxana, when it came to her family in terms of sort of moral leaders, <laughs> you scored. You scored. She had yeah. she had a trove of people to choose from. This yeah. Harriet Beecher Stowe is just one of them. There's a bishop who was decapitated yeah. by Henry VIII. Yes. There was uh, the first the founder of the first medical school in America yes. as a relative. Yes and someone who became the godfather to the son of the Lenape chief, White Eyes, and the sent first, him to Princeton. The first person so. of color to go to Princeton. Um, so yeah, so I had all this baggage, and uh, <laughs> I mean, usually writers are trying to strike out into new territory, so, so this issue, the issue of race in America and slavery, because of Harriet Beecher Stowe, I really thought, I can't say a word about this. My family has done this subject. It's finished. But finding out about Dawson, which was much, I mean, Harriet Beecher Stowe was a wonderful writer, and she was passionate, and she presented this subject to American readers in a way that it hadn't been presented before, and she really caused an enormous response. Um, and so she was absolutely black and white, and all my Beecher ancestors are black and white. There's good and bad, and that's, there's no crossover. But Dawson was so morally, this situation was so much more ambiguous and complicated that I became fascinated by it. And I had to understand what it was like not to be Harriet Beecher Stowe, who didn't have to hesitate for a split second. She knew exactly where she stood. But for Dawson, it was very different. And I was really interested in the ambiguities of that. And um, I want to get to the sources that both of you relied on as you composed your books, but the, the, I want to just, while we're speaking to you, Roxana, pause over the violence. This is a novel that's permeated by violence, racial violence in Charlestown after, after the Civil War as Reconstruction is slowly dismantled, often in vicious ways, um, by angry white mobs, often enacting vigilante justice to close down voting polls for black citizens, black freedmen. Um, how aware were you when you undertook this of the, of the context, even immediately locally there in Charleston? And so it's a great question. And when I started the book, I had no idea of the violence. But um, one of my sources was the historical archives of the, of the Charleston News and Courier, which still exists today as the Charleston Post and Courier. And if you subscribe to it, you have access to their files, which was a researcher's dream. So every morning I could get up and go to 1873 in Charleston and find out everything that was being thought of. And because my great-grandfather was the editor, he was responsible for every single article in the paper, and he'd written half of them. So I knew what he thought about everything, about opera, about mining, about agriculture. I, I, I knew what he thought. Um, but I was looking for specific things. I knew certain incidents that had taken place, and so I was looking for those. But as I was reading the, arc, the newspaper, I became aware of these accounts of horrific violence. And it was not just white vigilantes against blacks. It was white men shooting each other over nothing. They, they would ambush, ambush each other with knives. They would throw rocks from a window, and within 30 seconds, three people had been had their knives, their throats slashed. Disagreements over an editorial Frank might publish in the newspaper might be resolved through a duel. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. was, you know, this is shades of today when there are attacks on freedom of the press. <laughs> I mean, anyway, yeah. violence people, was... People right. shot each other all the time, and Dawson, being from England, and he refused to carry a gun. He did not believe in violence. And he was appalled by the violence here. So he 
he put those articles in the paper. There was a there was a political campaign in Louisiana at one point, which I put in the book. There was something like 15 people killed, all politicians. The man running for governor shot the other man running for governor, and his secretary shot his wife. And I mean, it just it was like a dumb. You couldn't believe it. So it became a, clear to me, and I know you'll find you'll say the same thing, but. As you do research, you learn things that divert you into a different path. So as I was reading these things, I was at first I was saying, well, that's not what I'm looking for. And then I thought, it is what I'm looking for. Yeah. And it became more clear to me that I was dealing with the legacy of slavery, because slavery is based on violence to the body. And we had had that kind of violence in this country for 200 years before I started writing this. And that violence had permeated the Southern culture. And so that was part of this terrible legacy that, that, that our country had. Let's, let's bring Louis into this conversation. Now, your book, Courting Mr. Lincoln, although set in the 19th century, um, you, you know, has a different set of challenges. You did not have really an opportunity to discover new things in the way that Roxana did looking at Charleston. You point out somewhere that, in fact, your book may be the 9,100th and first book yes. to address Lincoln. Yes. So that's a whole different set of obstacles. Why tackle Lincoln? Well, in fact, I did feel like I was finding something new. I felt like I was finding something that hadn't been explored. I don't have the amazing family that Roxana has, so I have to, I have to find my, my subjects elsewhere. But I, because I am a sporadic and almost recovering mystery writer, um, I tend to gravitate toward, toward mysteries. Uh, and this, one's, this particular mystery starts in 1842, January of 1842. Abraham Lincoln has the most severe depressive episode of his life. He's living in Springfield, Illinois at the time. Um, he is prostrate for, for weeks. He, he can't go to work. Friends despair of his life. They take all the sharp objects away. Um, never again in his life would he be at such a low ebb psychologically. Um, and he would refer to that ever afterward to cryptically to the fateful first of January. Now historians traditionally looked at that and said, oh, that's when he broke off with his uh, engagement with Mary Todd. But on that same day, his closest friend in the world, Joshua Speed, told him, announced that he was leaving and going back to Kentucky. So these were twin traumas happening at the same time, <laughs> having two very intense relationships that were going on simultaneously. And I thought, this is, this is a triangle. Um, this is a triangle. And so that's what it became. It became a, a courtship novel, um, but also a triangle with Lincoln in the middle, and then on, the, on both sides of it. Um, I don't think I'd be pushing things to, to add the word love to that triangle. But yes. It's really a love triangle, yes. right? And yes. these two figures sort of vying for Lincoln's affection and devotion. Yes. So we have these chapters, all, well, sections really, alternating perspectives between Mary Todd, his future wife, and his very intimate friend and bedmate, Joshua yes. Speed. They shared a bed for three and a half years. Uh, now, it was, it was common in those days for bachelors to do that, but what was less common about was the, was the, the intimacy of this relationship. It really, they were inseparable, um, and they, you, can, you look at their letters. Actually, what made me want to write this book were the letters that Lincoln wrote to Speed uh, in 1842 in advance of Speed's marriage. Um, and these were in incredibly intimate. And I also saw two men that were sort of coaxing and coaching each other toward what we would now call a heteronormative lifestyle. You know, it's like, you can do this. You can, <laughs> and, and, and write me the day after the wedding night. Let me know. Yeah, you know. Louis, was this, so with Lincoln, with this episode, this puzzle, really it's a puzzle for historians, yeah. what was the nature of that relationship with Joshua Speed? Was this something you'd been mulling for a long time? Or um, how did I, it gel into a novel? How did it gel? It really started with, with, with Lincoln and, and Mary, because the, the, the other mystery there was how, how did they come together? Uh, it, was a, it was a famously fraught and complicated marriage, uh, but also a loving and enduring one. Uh, but they were two very different people. And I think people who don't know much about Mary Todd as a young woman, or Lincoln as a young man, and I don't think most of us do know a lot, uh, don't kind of get how that happened. So that was the initial mystery. But then as I wandered through the streets of Springfield, Illinois, circa 1841, um, Joshua was kind of waiting there in the shadows. There was a book that came out in 2005 by C.A. Tripp called The Intimate World of 
Abraham Lincoln. It sounds almost like a radio soap opera from the 1930s. <laughs> um, and that was the first book to really lay out um, evidence for what Tripoli was, the fact that Lincoln was a gay man. Uh, but as long ago as the 1920s, Carl Sandburg wrote that there was, quote, a, a touch of lavender about the relationship between these two men. So I think people have always felt there was something unusual in their intimacy, whether it was sexual or not. I don't know whether you personally came to a conclusion about that relationship, but the way you handle it in the book, I don't want to spoil it for people, but it's very artful because you depict in great detail the intimacy of these two men without sort of tipping your hand either way, it's fair to say. I mean, yeah, I wanted the reader to make that call. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could make a call from the same evidence, but I wanted the readers to, to come to their own decisions. So a lot of it is unspoken. And, and I thought that, that such a love coming around in the 1840s would have been unspoken. There wouldn't have been a language for it. The word homosexual was decades away from even being in the English language. So it, it would have expressed itself in these kind of strange um, and tacit ways. And let's, let's talk about Mary Todd just for a minute, because you've alluded to the fact that historians are puzzled by this woman that Lincoln married, and they haven't always been very complimentary about her. No. Um, tell us a little bit about how your <laughs> portrait differs from the conventional wisdom about well, I think. Um, I think Mary got the rawest deal of maybe any first lady um, in American history, and that's partly because um, her history was written by her enemies. One man in particular, a guy named William Herndon, who was Lincoln's longtime law partner, and his first oral biographer. Uh, so Herndon did the unbelievably useful task of interviewing everybody who had ever uh, known Lincoln as a child and going forward. So it's a, it's a treasure trove for historians, but the, this, the history that he published was deeply biased against Mary Todd, whom he loathed. She loathed him as well. And, and the arc that he created from this was that, that she made Lincoln's life a misery. He, he, he dragged out the, the shade of Anne Rutledge, who was long dead. A lot of people never even heard of her, but paid, posited her as the one true love of Lincoln's life. And Mary was the millstone around his neck, and, and it just of, was an act of revenge against Mary Todd. There were a lot of vicious feline metaphors. That oh, yes. The she cat of the age. Or she she wolf and she wolf, she, and yeah, yeah, yeah. female wildcat. No, that's not the Mary we meet in your book at all. Well, one of the nice things about right, catching her at this part of her life, she's only 20, I think, when the book starts, is that you catch her at her best. And, and what I, I think a lot of people don't know about her is that she was. Um, so how intelligent she was. She was unusually well-educated for a woman of her era. Uh, even Herndon called her brilliant. Um, and she was passionate about politics. Uh, she came from a political family in Kentucky. And so she came to Springfield not just looking for a husband, but looking for a candidate to marry, someone to, to back. And what I find particularly impressive about her was her prescience in picking Lincoln, who was on nobody's shortlist to become president of the United States within 20 years. He wasn't even considered the leading politician of Springfield, Illinois. So the fact that she, she kind of looked through all his rawness and his you know, uncouthness and his, his rough edges and found somebody um, that she could, she could stake a claim on, you know, that, that stake a future on, I think that speaks well to her, her judgment. She's very witty in the novel. She reminds me of a Jane Austen heroine, sort of an Elizabeth Bennet. She's very outspoken, very opinionated. Yeah, yeah. At one point Jane someone Austen. says, you would have been a great statesman, you know? Yes, yes, she, yes. You know. And she would have. Had she come along, and obviously yeah. in our uh, post-suffrage era, she would, she would have run her office herself. But that, the, only, the only way to do it was to was to find, a, find the right husband. And uh, you know, at, at a certain level, she, she, she bet right, because she could have chosen, you know, she had other choices, including Stephen Douglas. So um, she chose Lincoln. All right, well, let's talk about sources and um, the restrictions that a writer of historical fiction imposes on him or herself in terms of factual accuracy. Because, of course, you're not only going to be judged on aesthetic qualities, your storytelling prowess, your beautiful prose, but <laughs> on your accuracy. So Roxana, you, your book contains all kinds of evidence in it, including snippets of editorials, um, congressional testimony, diaries. In fact, Frank Dawson's wife, Sarah, kept an extensive journal that was eventually published, and I think to great success. Um, like all other ancestors of yours, um, <laughs> she too was, you know, quite an accomplished person. Um, so tell us, how did you integrate all this material? And well, um, that's another really good question. <coughs> and as a biographer, I felt um, an absolute obligation to 
not to change any of the facts. These are historical people. The, the historical record is established, and I, I didn't want to change anything. And I didn't change anything. There is nothing. And every time I do a talk about it, somebody raises their hand and says, so what did you change? And I say, nothing. And they say, but what did you make up? And I say, <laughs> that, that's my next question. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, nothing. And there are no footnotes, but everything in the book is documented. And they, people will say, no, but, you, but it's a novel. You, you changed something, right? And I say, OK, I did. There is one thing I made up totally, whole cloth. One day, a bird gets into the house. I made that up. It didn't happen, or it did happen. I don't know about it. But everything else is drawn on. I mean, the fact is that Frank was an editor, editor so his editorials are there in the paper for 25 years. He published his own reminiscences of a Confederate service. All of his letters to his family during the Civil War are, are extant. Um, lots of his professional letters, all Sarah's letters to her families. I mean, there, thank you, David Rubenstein, but all my family's archives, and that's that group of family, are at the David Rubenstein Library at Duke. And it's a room the size of this, I imagine. I didn't actually go in it, but it's just packed with documents. So, I, you know, there was everything that I ever wanted with, was in there in terms of the family. <clears throat> And then there are police re records and congressional testimony that all fed into this narrative. And I went back and forth during the writing of it, thinking maybe I should just make it into a straightforward historical document, a biography, not a novel. But as a novelist, and you know this, Lou, um, I couldn't give up those two things that are really the most important tools of the novelist, and one is dialogue which is the most intimate and true way in which we communicate. And it has nothing to do with somebody stating in a paragraph that the two were finding themselves closer than ever, which you don't, doesn't really mean anything, but a, a dialogue, somebody saying, well, so why did you say that? That indicates closeness. But um, so I couldn't give up dialogue and I couldn't give up the interior monologue. Yeah which is so important for the novelist, and you can't get there as a biographer. You can never say as a biographer, she must have been thinking, because we don't know what she was thinking. But in Anna Karenina, as she's in the carriage on her way to the railroad station, her state of mind is shown because she is watching the people out in the street and she's looking at the signs, and we understand from her thoughts that she's in a state of despair. And the novel would be nothing without her thoughts. It would just be a, a, a soapy story of a woman who has an affair, but it's the interior life. It's that, the interior life. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I, I drew on the documents, which are limitless. And, um, and the other thing is that I understood, I would never have dared do this book about somebody else's family. <laughs> but when I was writing the O'Keefe book, although I, I met O'Keefe once, but not long before I wrote the book, so I couldn't interview her for the book, but I did interview her family members, and it became clear to me that every fam since every family has a culture, I was actually absorbing O'Keeffe's persona and her thoughts by interviewing her family. So there were things about these people that were deeply familiar to me, and I realized that I was actually aware of them in a way that no one else would be. And that Dawson, for example, loved music, was very musical, loved to sing, loved to play the piano, and he would come home after going to a concert that he had never, music he'd never heard before, he'd come home and sit down at the piano and play it. And my father would do that. Wow. So I started feeling these are people that I know in ways that I wouldn't know anybody so else. So you felt a certain confidence of exactly. that comes from recognition, really. Yeah. How did you handle dialogue? I'm gonna ask Louis to jump in as well, yeah. because you, you're not making anything up, so, but you're transposing from one kind of source and documentation to a different form. How do you decide how to do that? Um, you have to have, um, you know, conflict is the, way, is the engine that drives novels, that drives fiction, so you have to have people disagreeing with each other over important issues. And uh, you, what's always worried me about historical fiction is the dialogue, um, because we tend to, people who are writing today about another period tend to make it very stilted 
and make it sound like letters, which are much more formal than dialogue. But if you read Trollope and Jane Austen, it's very lively, nor Tolstoy. But the person that I use, every, every time I write a book, I use one book that I read every morning. I read a few pages of it just to remind myself of where I'm trying to go. And for this book, I read Hilary Mantel oh, because yeah. well, she Paul, manages. Which, but which book? What? Um, it didn't matter, actually. I, I worked in different places. Sometimes it was Wolf Hall. Sometimes it was Bring Up the Bodies. Um, but she, and I met her once, and I said, how did you do this dialogue? Her dialogue is so contemporary. And she said, she said something completely mystifying. And uh, somebody said, oh, yeah, she didn't want to tell you, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Trade secret. She said. <laughs> But her answer was, she said, yes, we had to go back before Shakespeare. This is not Shakespearean dialogue. It's before that. I don't know what that means. I don't know hey, what she's know. drawing on. And I don't know how that would help. But anyway, somehow she makes the dialogue utterly contemporary yeah. and yet persuasive as a 16th century piece of writing. So she was my muse. She was my, my model. And I can't tell you anything more than that. I don't know how. I think David Mitchell once referred to the process as antiquing, um, we, that the hybrid you create between contemporary and, and past. Because you don't want to write 19th century dialogue. That would, be, that would feel stilted or feel like a stunt, really. But, but finding that, that, that hybrid quality. And so that's, I, I find I do it by ear after a while. And, and part of that is just reading so much in the period that I just start internalizing it. Um, in terms of, though, I'm not as ethical as Roxana, so I, I do make up. I do make. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I do make up stuff. Uh, I, I will give an example. The the climax. The Mary in the the book takes a climactic journey, that that she did not take in real life, um, and she does that just because I needed her to do that. Um, but I, I know Roxana's like she's going crazy right now. <laughs> la la la. Uh, um, so and and I but I I don't honestly make apologies for it because to me the, the, the job of a novelist is to, is to step in where the historical record falls silent and we go into that, that quiet space and we fill it with something and, and it's speculative and it involves dialogue and sometimes for me it involves reordering time sequence. I try to stick to the factuality of these people as much as I can uh, but in my mind from the start I'm telling a story. So when people, people ask, you know, why don't you say in the afterword you know, which parts are true, like they were asking, okay, which parts are true, which yes. aren't, it's like, I, I don't want to tear at the integrity of the story that way, I'm giving you a story, and a lot of it's true, and some of it's my imagination, and, but, but I'm not going to pull apart the, the threads, you know, so. Did you consult scholars for parts of it, or really rely on secondary sources? You didn't have a scholar read the novel for... Plausibility no. or no, 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 I probably shouldn't. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm so curious. I mean, there are many. There's a wonderful scene where Joshua Speed basically has to teach Lincoln how to how to sort of be in proper society. He teaches him how to waltz, mm -hmm. how to um, use a fork and knife. Yeah. Um, you know, when he 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 fails to take off his silk hat at a dinner, and that's a real faux pas. And Joshua has to break it to him. You know, you really need to take that hat off. Um, so how much of that is invention, or how much do we know about it's, that? That's, that's, that's speculation, because um, I, we look, Lincoln, the Lincoln who came to Springfield in 1836, I think it was, was a uh, rube. Um, I say that in a nice way, but he, he, was, he came from New Salem. He had one, one year of formal education. Um, and he, you know, he lived in, in, off the land, he lived in a very rural lifestyle. So I thought someone would have had to take him in hand. And who better do that Joshua Speed, who came from wealth, who was a Kentucky gentleman, who would certainly have known all the things to do, escorting ladies up, up or down a staircase, how to, how to lift them into a carriage, all these little traits. And actually, I found a wonderful... How to tie a, how to knot a tie. How to knot a tie, and how to, you know, and find and nicer clothes. So I thought he would, he, would be, he would have been the one, because they were so close, to take him in hand and go through that Pygmalion kind of process, really, that they go through. So, yeah, that was just me looking at the available facts and figuring, okay. Um, There's another scene I wanted to ask you about where Lincoln actually goes to visit the Speed household, yes. which is a rather grand place so, yeah, plantation in Kentucky, yeah. and there are slaves. And yeah. he's uncomfortable with being served in this way yes. by a slave. And there's an extraordinary moment where he expresses his unease and says, you know, to Joshua Speed, I myself have been basically a slave. Yes. And that really struck me 
how are you, are you going out on a limb there? Is this a, no? That he actually did say that. that. Yeah, that he did no, say that. He said, "My father, my father sort of sold me out to do labor as I grew up. I had no say in the matter. I right. didn't get paid." No. Yes, that's true. No, he he definitely uh, used that word to describe himself. But of course, in this in the next breath, he's saying, "But that ended when I was 21. That ended when I became of age. I no longer had to do that." And the, and for for the. The slaves in this plantation, that of course won't happen. Slavery would be a bit of a bone of contention between those two men. They were never quite as close once, uh, once they got married, and of course they were living apart, and slavery did come up in their letters to each other. It was a, it was a serious tension, because Lincoln was not an abolitionist, but was definitely um, not, a, not a, a proponent of slavery. So. Exactly. Well, I'm curious about the timing of these books. Um, I, I know we have just a few more minutes before we open up the floor to questions, but um, we, they happen to land at a moment when we're going through a period of renewed interest in the Civil War period. In particular, I think the post-Civil War period. Um, there are, you know, Reconstruction and the dismantling of Reconstruction, the period called Redemption before Jim Crow. There's lots of new scholarship about this period, including Stony the Road by Henry Louis Gates, Jr., who's here today somewhere. <laughs> um, were you thinking about, I mean, did, your books happen to resonate with contemporary concerns. Was that a conscious thought, or is that just one of these coincidences that... Oh, gosh, I don't know if you can write a, a book set in 1842 America and not talk about slavery at some level. Now, right. now Illinois was a, a, a free state, but you could import slaves, and Elizabeth's sister has imported slaves from, from Kentucky. So they're coming across, and Mary, but Mary, I should want, Mary was either, even further to the left than Lincoln on slavery. She refused to have slaves of her, of her own. Um, so I, I just feel like you, you have to address it, and, and it reminds me of this wonderful um, educational initiative that the Times has started. Uh, right, this year is the 400th anniversary of the first, um, the arrival of the first yeah. slaves in this country, and it's ama an amazing project that the Times, in particular the Times Magazine, has undertaken to kind of look at yeah. um, that period well, and its legacy. And, and such a provocative yeah. thing to, to, to yeah. kind of put out there because we're used to treating slavery as an episode. Yes. And in fact, it's, it's woven into the, the entire fabric of it's our It's tra an ongoing history. trauma. Yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, and it's resonating yeah. down to the present day, so I, I, I love that approach, and I think it's really useful to, for, for novelists, for historians, for Americans to look at it that way. How about you, Roxana? Um, the book took me five years to write, and then it takes a year to come out, so, you know, six or seven years ago, things were different in this country, and I, I don't know why I started, but with each year that I was working on it, it became more and more topical, and more, more and more revel relevant, and more urgent, yeah. There's something I have to ask you. There's a subplot, without giving too much away in your novel, um, that is actually more of a kind of familial subplot. So a lot of the trauma and crisis in the novel is our social one that, around slavery and, and its legacy and its violence. But there's a subplot involving a, an au pair from Switzerland who lives in the household, Frank Dawson's household, and cares for his children. And, um, gets involved with an unsavory character, a doctor, a kind of louche figure who lives next door. Was that a subplot that you knew about before you undertook the novel? Because I, I imagine that's not the kind of thing that Dawson is, is narrating in his, in his <laughs> memoirs, for example. No, he is not narrating that. Um, but I did know about that, oh, I mean, because it? it is such a is it dramatic story. story. It's a, so dramatic. Um, and it's well known in Charleston. I mean, everyone knows that story. <laughs> So, um, and, and my father told me aspects of that story, um, bits of it that he had heard. So I, I was aware of these. In fact, he told me a version of it which turned out to be part of a dream that was, his mother had told him. It, it's, it, there are a lot of powerful dreams, in, or a couple at least, in this novel yeah. that are very prophetic, it turns out. But I'll let you all discover them if you haven't read the book. We're going to turn it over to questions um, at either of the microphones that are in the aisles. But I want to just ask you, just in a sentence, do you want to say something about what you're working on now? No. There, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm going to sound like a bladdermouth if I talk about it. Um, I'm, I'm actually go, moving on to... Uh, Another dead president. Uh, this is John Kennedy um, and, and Jackie as, as another courtship. But look at it from the angle of, of Jack's best friend, 
Lem Billings, who was his uh, closest uh, friend from Choate onward through life and was a closeted gay man and a really interesting figure in the, the a zealot like presence in all these White House photos. And, um, so there you're the, the 9,101st. <laughs> so, yes, yes, yes. Okay. But, it, but, uh, but may, maybe the first novel to have Lem as the sort of the major figure, anyway. Lem. All right, so it's hard for me to see. I think we may have a question. Do we have a question? Yes. Over, we do? Yes, okay, here. <laughs> um, hi. So, as a country, we have sort of an idealistic view of Lincoln as a person, and I was wondering how you dealt with that versus the flaws of him as a person and who he was. Oh, that's, that's a great question, getting, getting past the idealized version of Lincoln, because we do have this idealized version of him. Uh, but again, one of the interesting things about catching him at this stage of his life is he is flawed, and he's still finding his way. He was deeply ambitious. Uh, politician, and he wasn't above getting his hands a little dirty. Uh, this book includes two of the episodes that he was most embarrassed about in his life. One is the climax of the book, which I won't reveal, but the other one was incident where he was at the, in the Whigs, he was in the Whig party, and they wanted to avoid giving quorum to the Democrat majority. So he and a couple of other legislators jumped out of a window uh, to avoid giving quorum. It, was, <laughs> it, made, him, it made him a laughing stock. Across it. The, all the all the uh, Democratic newspapers made great hay with it. So he's making mistakes, um, and so it's 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 useful to see that. But I will say that one of the things I that d the book deepened for me about him was his in, his enigmatic quality. Even the people who knew him while he was alive never felt like they really knew him. Um, and I would say that I I I'm, that writing it only deepened that enigma for me. There, there's always going to be a mystery about him. I mean, that's why there are 9,101 books. <laughs> okay. okay, on this side. To Lewis, um, have you had reaction from Lincoln scholars since your book was published? Do you keep them off your back? What has the nature <laughs> of that been? I have not had a lot of reaction from Lincoln scholars. Um, I'm a little disappointed, actually. I, I was... Um, I was hoping to stir up a little more controversy than, than apparently I have. I think because it's a work of fiction, because as you say, it's, it's a quiet uh, story. I'm not kind of make, I'm not like C.A. Tripp and you know, kicking the door down. Um, but no, I haven't. I've, there's been silence from Springfield, Illinois as well. I have received no, uh, no invitations. My dream was that um, uh, Tucker Carlson would boycott the book. Uh, <laughs> but that has not come to fruition. If you know him, if anybody knows him, see if you can make that work. <laughs> yes, thank you. Over here. In looking in, at old newspaper stories um, or just other sources for a, a family mystery of my own, I found that took place in 1905. I found that depending on the political leaning of the newspaper at the time, um, there were probably 20 versions of the same incident. How did you, did either of you wade through maybe different, different depictions of the same event um, to determine what the truth was? Especially, not so much with the Lincoln book, but with the Dawson book, where there might not be other sources besides the newspapers. Um, well, first of all, there were, first of all, I was interested in Dawson's take on things, so I wasn't trying to find out what other people were thinking about a particular incident. I wanted his, what he thought. Um, and secondly, at that time, the newspapers traded articles, so he would run something and say, this is from the Greenville, South Carolina um, register. So I, I had a sense of what other newspapers were saying about things, and they would argue with each other, and he'd write an editorial directed at Gary, who was in Atlanta. So I, I could feel the conversation um, when it was, came to things like court testimony. Um, there is pretty much going to be one verbatim version of that. It's going to be the stenographer taking down everybody's statement. There were certainly different, different versions of stories that I had to figure out on my own and just say, OK, it looks as though it's most likely this version is the correct one for these reasons. Um, I don't know. That was the way I proceeded. Do you want to weigh in on that? Uh, I, well, one of the things, you, as you mentioned, the book is told from two perspectives, and I sometimes use that to 
uh, look at the same events from those two perspectives. So in, in, in fact, it challenges the whole idea that there is one truth to be derived from any of these things. That's why I like multiple narrators. I think they, they cast doubt on each other. This is great. This gives me an opportunity to share a peeve with you that I often have with historical fiction and ask. You know, I read your book. I haven't read either of your books, but I think I will. Um, <laughs> when I read a book that incorporates real people, and the one that started this with me was Ragtime. When I'm reading the book, I'm constantly asking myself, did this really happen? <laughs> and I can't help but think it somehow detracts from my enjoyment of the book. And I'm curious, like your books sound like they're great, they sound like they would stand alone if you were writing them about John Doe and Mary Doe, as opposed to Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln and your ancestors. So how do you make that decision, and do you think about this aspect that the reader is wrestling with the historical fact? I mean, I love the way you address this right up front about you didn't make anything up. Well, you made the whole book up. <laughs> The book is the interior dialogue. The book is the dialogue. The, you know, the facts are the facts, but the beauty of the book I'm sure I'm going to find is in the parts that you made up. And what's your peeve? <laughs> that I have to try to wrestle with what's true and what isn't true. I just told you, everything in my book is true. I, I, I really mean it. There, I, there's documentary evidence for every event every exchange um, for that very reason. And I find it um, distracting, as you do, if I read a book and I don't, and it's based on real people and I don't know what's true and what isn't. That, that does distract me. So I wanted to correct that in my book so that um, you, you do know that everything, every event that happens in the book actually happened. I think I'm the, I think I'm the peeve. I think I'm the peeve. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm thinking of Shakespeare's Richard III, for instance. That is a work of historical fiction. Uh, it's, it has very little historical basis. Um, it's, it's really meant more as a psychological portrait of a particular kind of evil. Um, I don't think anybody, you know, Shakespeare did not consult any historians. He grabbed what was ever on his shelf and threw, threw stuff together. Uh, and his, and his, um, his, his intent was to tell a story that would hold people's attention for three hours and maybe say something about the corrupting nature of, of, of the crown, but I... I is, maybe if I could reframe your question, I think maybe what you're asking is, what is the added value of grounding this story in history? Louis could have been inspired by Mary Todd and Joshua Speed's relationships with Lincoln and then changed the names, and it could have been a, published as a work of fiction and no one would be the wiser. And because you're saying sometimes to kind of a reader ha is constantly asking himself or herself, was this really how it happened? Um, why not do it that way? And I wonder if the answer has to do with there being a kind of more cogent moral force to suggesting that in fact this isn't an invented issue. The moral dilemmas in this story are the ones of, of human history. I, I don't know what the answer is. Is that, is that what you're asking? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for, for me, um, the, 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 the reason I'm drawn to these characters is that they were there, they were real people at a real moment in our history. So for me, these characters reflect on our own, our own past in a way that um, I, I don't think I would be able to make up two characters like that in 1889. I, I wouldn't have the tools to do it. I can make those characters up today because I live in this world and I could, I, I could know those people. But these people are not just part of the historical record. They, they are real and this was a really important part of our history. So I, I could not have made this up um, with anonymous people. I mean, if, if I had done that, it would be a completely different book. Then I would be in charge of the narrative, I would be in charge of the drama. Um, it would be completely different. This is a book that was created by history, and it reflects on our nation. So that's why it was important to me. 
Do you want to add anything? Well, I just, uh, I think I would reframe the question as not what's true and what's false, but what is, this story, what is this story that I'm about to read? It has, it has actual people in it, but what, what, what is this story about? What, what will happen over the course of the story? And, and, and just release that, that hole. But I know that's, that, that need for, for an immediate factual um, grounding. But I, that's how I, I read fiction as fiction, even it, regardless of whether it's historical or, or, or completely um, made up. I just, I, I, I'm telling a story. So. But I, I know that doesn't, I don't know if it gets to the peeve or not. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Do we have a question on either side? Or from the audience in the fourth row there? The role of tone. Um, well, you're addressing that in a way because you have these dueling perspectives. Yeah. I mean, that we do give two, at least two angles on Lincoln's attractions: one from a man and one from a woman. Yeah. He eventually married. Right <laughs> yeah. <again. coughs> and I guess I resist the notion that there is a single unified objective truth anywhere out in history or anywhere else. But I don't know how tone addresses that. But yeah. I think I think uh, tone is really important. If if I understand what you mean by it. And writing my book was, was a challenge in that way because I'm writing from the perspective of today and the way we see slavery today. And I was trying to write about people who saw it very differently. And I, was, I had to calibrate my own response, my own feelings about it, um, to those in the book. And it was, um, that was very challenging. I, I didn't want to be a moral presence who was slapping down every decision the characters had made because we can't judge them actually by today's mm -hmm. standards any more um, than our grandchildren should, our great grandchildren should be judging us. I mean, they will be, and <laughs> they're going to be very sorry about the environment. But um, <laughs> you can't, you have to be very careful about how you deal with people in another culture at another period. So tone is, is crucially important, I agree. All right, before we end, um, I wanted to announce, um, if you don't know, both Roxana and Louie will be signing their books in the signing area <laughs> at... Which is somewhere. Somewhere near here. At, do we know what time? 12.30. At 12.30, 12 so please feel free to approach them and continue this conversation. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much.